Hi, Peter Koch again with another video review of immersive technology. Today I want to talk about the Oculus Go and whether this is the device that will enable your enterprise or your education organization to actually start using immersive VR technology in a widespread, consistent manner. One of the big issues with using immersive technology for learning is what is the appropriate device for the solution you're trying to do. If you're trying to teach people how to operate mobile cranes, you kind of need to have uh, six dots. So you can have twin hand controllers to control the world and, and move around with dexterity uh, and be able to move your head and look out the cabin and, and those kind of scenarios um, in a complete 3D environment. But if, if your solution is a 360 video, then you don't need a six dot tracking system in fact, a 3 dot system like the Oculus Go is an ideal uh, delivery platform for that because those videos are shot from a fixed point of view and just being able to rotate your head is all the uh, input that you need. Um, but maybe you're doing an AR solution and you need something like that. The Microsoft HoloLens or upcoming devices like the Mirror Prism, which is a low-cost AR device. So first you need to decide you know, what, what kind of training scenarios are we going to be building and then which devices are going to be the best to operate inside the classroom. So let's say that you're doing 360 video training and sort of more basic 3D environment training, uh, maybe multi-user but, but within the confines of a 3 off system uh, to enable users to interact with each other. This device here, the Oculus Go, just launched and it launched for US $199. That is a significant breakthrough uh, on a standalone VR device uh, for many reasons uh, that I'll go into about this actual device. But that price point really brings it down. Up until now, um, in those three dot scenarios, you know, I've commonly been using the Gear VR with a Samsung S6, S, S8 phone uh, like this one. And this will set you back about $800 US to put this pair together. Um, you have issues of putting it, to, uh, because it's mobile VR, you need to be able to put the phone inside. Whenever you plug the, the headphone jack in, you know, the phone will fall out. Um, so it's pretty easy to damage. You need to charge this outside of the device. It overheats. There's a lot of issues with the Gear VR. There's a lot of wonderful things that are brought to the table that wasn't possible before. A lot of the scenarios I've done, you just couldn't have done it with desktop VR because you just can't get you know, 16 or 20 desktops into a space for people to learn together. Um, but this device really made that possible. But now this Oculus Go is really the culmination of where this technology uh, was moving to. So the fact that this can be bought from for $200 uh, and it's a complete unit, there's nothing to plug into it, uh, there's only a couple of ports on the side uh, to power it, uh, one lead on top to give you status of how it's going. Uh, it's just an amazing breakthrough. If you were going to buy 30 uh, VR headsets for, say, your classroom, $25,000 here for 30 of them, but, but under $6,000 for 30 of these. Um, so first, let's look at the hardware side of you for use in the enterprise space. This hardware is uh, really solid. It's really beautiful. Um, I actually find it really inviting. If, if you show someone like the Gear VR, it looks a bit techy. Will people want to put that on? Um, there's the, the headband um, and doing the Velcro. Just added a lot of friction to uh, actually getting people to get excited about VR. I mean, most people are excited because they haven't seen it before um, or, or it's something new uh, as part of the education. So you're not just watching a video and, or having class participation. But, you know, out of all the VR devices and AR devices I've got, this one is actually so inviting. And it's and it's many little things in it that that really work well together from a hardware point of view. The As I said, like, it's a beautiful looking device. It feels great in your hands. It's a very uh, non-techy kind of color, a bit like the Microsoft Surface color palette, actually. Uh, it, it fits right alongside my my mouse and keyboard. Um, the fact that, that it's got uh, really nice foam there that's replaceable. Um, 
and, and, and really big optics. But the, the best, one of the best features of this is how you put it on. Um, this, this elastic strap system where there's a bottom um, band and then a, a higher up band just means when you, when you put this on your head, it's, it just naturally pulls down and fits over your head and you can get it really comfortable really quickly. It's, it's, it's um, not talked about very often, but this, this is actually a wonderful way to put on a VR headset. And obviously the, the fact that you put it on and you're immediately in VR, there's, there's nothing to press, there's nothing to turn on. It senses that um, the, the light has gone dark because you've got it on your face and that you've moved your head and so it just automatically turns on. The charging system uh, in terms of a classroom scenario is, is really good. You simply get your cable and plug it in. So micro USB port. Um, and then you, you have a status light telling you uh, it's charging, green if it's good. You can just line these up in your, in your uh, classroom. I think you know um, a dock would have been a much better idea. I don't see how they could really make a dock with the position of where the power actually is on this. Um, maybe that's uh, one negative point that would be good later on if there was some you know, magnetic charging or some sort of dock that that would slide into. Uh, I think that would really help enterprise. Um, but this isn't a bad solution. I've seen a lot of iPad solutions in schools and they also just plug the cable in to charge them. Um, the built-in headphones that, that um, automatically funnel the sound down the strap to you uh, work really well. Um, there's, a, there's a headphone jack there if you need to use it. Um, and you can push that in without a phone dropping out, of course. But uh, in terms of what I've experienced so far with the audio, it's, it's really pleasant, it's a good sound level, uh, and it doesn't really interfere with other people that are, that are nearby in a classroom or training room scenario. Uh, but if it is, if the room's very quiet, then at least you have that option to plug in headphones and put them on top as well. Uh, the hand controller is required for the Oculus Go. Uh, every device needs to be paired with a hand controller. Um, it's kind of like the, the next step. It's pretty much got all the same buttons apart from the volume as the Gear VR controller and it's 100% uh, compatible with it. Um, it's got the, the front trigger button, it's got the trackpad on top and a button under the trackpad, the, the back button which can be used by the app. Uh, the long press on the back button from the Gear VR no longer uh, functions, so that used to take you out of the experience. So um, I haven't checked that yet whether apps can make use of the long press on the back button, but you can definitely get the short press. Uh, and then the Oculus Home button. Um, this is the only real issue I have with this hand controller, is that uh, a single press of the Oculus Home button will take you out of the experience and pause it, and then you can resume it. Um, which is not a very enterprise-friendly uh, experience, especially if you've got new users that, that aren't aware of how to use the Oculus Home and you, you probably don't want them to know about the Oculus Home. You want them to stay inside the environment that you filmed. On other controllers that Oculus have done, they have um, depressed that button in so it was less likely to be pressed. But for some reason here, they made the decision just to make it a flat button and it is quite easy to confuse uh, the back and the Oculus Home button uh, as a user. Um, the Oculus Home button actually uh, is a very important button in this scenario because uh, it's a three-dof controller. Oculus has tried to solve some of the issues of lining up that three-dof controller with where the user is facing. And so they've actually made it a requirement that every time you put the headset on, uh, you have to recalibrate the controller forward. And you do that by holding down the Oculus button for one second. Um, so that further sort of makes it difficult for users because A, they have to put the, the um, they have to calibrate the forward of the controller when they put the headset on and they have to be careful to hold it and not just tap it because it'll take them out of the experience. So that's uh, one small negative in terms of the, making that button being depressed would have been a little bit better. Um, the other side of a platform like this is the software that comes with it uh, and it's a really great personal um, platform the oculus platform for personal users to use unfortunately they don't have any enterprise features in there yet so it kind of lets down um, the enterprise through the software platform at this point 
I, I personally think Oculus are probably, you know, targeting the personal users first, getting widespread adoption, and they're probably busily building enterprise solutions as, as I record this. Um, what kind of problems are there? Well, for a start, to activate an Oculus Go, you need to you need to pair it with a companion app on your phone. And so that phone needs to have an Oculus account, and basically that links this device to uh, your personal information and also the Oculus Store and credit cards to buy apps and that kind of thing. Uh, also sets up your avatar, your avatar's name, whether you're left or right-handed. Uh, all those kind of settings are linked to your account. So if you want to deploy this to the enterprise, unfortunately right now you need to set up an Oculus account and um, pair this, this device uh, to that account. Now from what I can tell, there, there's no limit on the number of headphones or headsets you can pair to your Oculus account. So I probably recommend as an enterprise, you create a new email address just for managing the Oculus Goes. You register that with an Oculus account and then you pair all your devices to the same account. Um, the other downside of the Oculus platform is that there's no kiosk support. So um, you might be aware of using an iPad, you can put an app in a kiosk mode and then the user can't leave that app. If they restart the iPad, it automatically reruns the app and it stays in a lockdown state. Um, that would be a wonderful experience to have in here. Unfortunately, uh, there's no support for a kiosk mode. Um, if they did have support for that, then that would be great. They could lock out that home button uh, and users wouldn't make the mistake of, of exiting out of the, um, of the current experience. In terms of um, other enterprise kind of features, Really, you, you want kind of a mobile device management system where you can lock out certain features so the user can't go and turn off Wi-Fi uh, or can't go to the store to browse uh, while they're in experience. You really want to be able to have some kind of remote app installation feature. Um, that's kind of where this, this it is totally possible to sideload apps onto this, um, but it's a bit of a cumbersome process without some sort of enterprise uh, solution to help you. Uh, and on that subject, basically, if you want to get your own apps that you've developed or you've bought from other people that are outside of the Oculus Store, uh, I could find two different ways you could do it. One is um, you can you can sideload by USB. Um, one of the great um, things is that the OSIG system that Samsung had on the Gear VRs is gone. With the OSIG system, you had to sign each device in advance into the app before it would run on that device. Um, that was very frustrating for enterprise deployment um, and led to some other solutions uh, like Sideload VR where it kind of re-signed your apps for you. Uh, but it added that extra friction in trying to get an app out onto devices. There's still some friction with the sideloading process on the Oculus Go so far and it might be just because the Oculus Go launched. But basically um, you need to set your account to be a developer account and once you've done that, you can um, use the Android tools to connect via USB to this device and you can install apps um, the way that you, um, uh, you can with other Android phones. But when you go to run the app inside the Oculus Go, it doesn't appear in the main library uh, like it would on the Gear VR. It appears in an untrusted app list, which has just got the names of apps and their bundle IDs. It doesn't have a nice icon and stuff like that. So it's a little unintuitive when you try and run the app on the phone, on the Oculus Go, to actually launch it. If you do want to get it into the library with an, with an app icon, then you need to submit your app through the Oculus um, uh, developer portal. They have um, these release channels that allow for beta testing of apps before you publish them to the store. Uh, so you can use that mechanism to basically like put your app up into Oculus release it out as a preview app, which you can then uh, send to the email address that you've registered for these devices, and it'll download and it'll appear in the library. Uh, one, one limitation of that is that you can only uh, release out to 100 different emails. Uh, I don't know what the limitations are in terms of the one email, maybe getting it onto 100 Oculus Go's, um, but there may be some limitations around that process. But that was the best process I found for actually being able to see the icon in the library and launch it like a normal app. Um, both those solutions will run offline. So if you do want to turn off Wi-Fi so users uh, can't just browse the store and, and visit your network, 
uh, then both those scenarios enable you to uh, launch the apps offline. I also tried to install apps via the web browser, but I haven't been able to work out how that's possible yet. I can download the APK from the browser uh, with the right MIME type, but it won't actually let you uh, install the APK or, or run it. So at the moment, side loading via USB or the Apple release channel preview system is the only way I've seen so far. Now, if you're just doing 360 video, you might not need an app. Uh, the Oculus Go ships with uh, a built-in app called the Oculus Galleries, which is a really good video player. It will play back traditional videos uh, and in traditional sort of 2D videos, uh, you get to pick what kind of environment you're sitting in, whether it's a cinema or on the moon. Um, or you can switch the video to 360 or 360 stereo playback uh, and then it totally immerses around you. Uh, that's built in and one of the great features of that is that uh, this device can play that from a DLNA media server on your network, uh, which are very uh, cheap and easy to put in. And then basically you can browse the network, pick the video and just hit play. Um, if, if that's a little bit too difficult for you to set up um, for each user, maybe if you do have 10 of these or 30 of these, uh, that's a bit impractical, you can install a custom app that would uh, automatically play the video, uh, similar to the one that, that I've done before where you can remotely play the video synchronized for all the people in the same space. Uh, so, my recommendation is that this is definitely the device that's ready for the enterprise. It's really going to launch immersive training uh, for organizations. It looks good, it's easy to charge, it's easy to clean. I would say you put uh, a bunch of cubbies or hooks and you can hang the devices up, pair them together, put some sort of asset tag on so you can track which controller goes with which device and um, deploy that to your enterprise. If you have any questions, feel free to email me, contact me through my blog, talesfromtherift.com, and I can't wait to see lots of these devices get into the enterprise.